so much, and well done. Please be seated. Friends, as we come into the presence of God, we are reminded of the words of Scripture, sometimes which feel harsh to us, but perhaps we can hear them in the sense of good news of gospel. When the Scriptures say that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Long story short, in light of God's holiness, we discover that all of us are broken. All of us are in need of God's mercy and grace. None of us have got it sorted all the way out. But because we know we need God's mercy and grace, we are reminded that we have a God of mercy and grace. And so confident that God hears us when we pray and is eager to redeem and restore us, let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Let us pray. We confess our sin to you, Almighty Father, friend of the poor and needy, for not loving you with all our heart, O God. For not loving you with all our soul, O God. For not loving you with all our mind, O God. For not loving you with all our strength, O God. For not loving you in the same way. Forgive us and show us your kindness that we might do the same. My friends, the scriptures don't stop where we stopped it, thanks be to God. Because the scripture, that scripture continues, but if we confess our sins, our Lord is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all, hear it again, all unrighteousness. It is not our prayers, it is not our work, rather it is the word of God that proclaims our sins forgiven through the love and mercy of God. And we are freed from our burden and invited to live a life of faith. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We now hear the the Bible. For the Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32, found on page 30 of your pew Bible. This is where Jacob wrestles Peniel. The same night he got up and took his two wives his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them across the stream and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was pulled out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. For Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Our epistle reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1, 13 through 25 on page 190 of your pew Bible. 
For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit against to a yoke of slavery. And this is the nature of Christian freedom. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desire is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Please join me in the responsive reading as printed in your bulletin. It is Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to you, Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundaries of the earth have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the face. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our final reading for this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Luke. We'll be in the 8th chapter, specifically verses 43 to 48. Which I'm going to start the second half of verse 42. As he went, the crowds pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of Jesus' clothes, and immediately her hemorrhages stopped. Then Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, someone has touched me, for I noticed the power had gone out from me. But when the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Thank you very much. Please be seated. And friends, I'm going to have to invite you and per- I'm going I'm to ask you to permit me to just kind of rip off the band-aid this morning that I am feeling, is that this is one of those Sundays, I don't care how long you've been in ministry, I don't care where you line up, progressively, conservatively, somewhere in the middle, whatever, If you've been in ministry for any length of time, you've thought about the Sunday, that what you would say on the Sunday after something changed with Roe v. Wade. There, I said it. I needed to tear that Band-Aid off. And we are here. This is that Sunday, and I still don't exactly know what it is that I want to say. There's a couple reasons for that. Maybe next time we as a country make major unprecedented changes to the way we understand law and human rights, I might ask the country not to do it on a week when I'm preparing to go on vacation. I've got vacation brain as much as I've got anxiety brain and my mind is filled brain. There's a lot going on upstairs here today and I offer that to you in a moment of vulnerability. But here we are again as a pastor and a congregation, and we as a country. Yet again, just weeks after we did Uvalde, now we are also in a situation that invites us to consider fundamental, foundational principles which touch up against the very core of our faith. Now, my prayer last night, sitting with these emotions and thinking about this morning, was no more or no less than saying to God, yet again, what exactly is it, God, that you expect me to do on this morning? What is it that you want from me? I still don't know. But here's what I do. Here's what I do know anyway. Whether you won this week or whether you lost this week, because that's how it's always framed, right? Our country and our world, once again, on this particular day, is set on edge. And it falls to us, the people of God, on our weekly celebration of the resurrection. Let us not forget why it is we gather. We come to celebrate the resurrection, do we not? falls to us yet again to consider our times in light of the gospel. So if you came to hear me talk the other side out of their position, I'm afraid I have very little to offer you today. That is not my point. Frankly, this morning I am filled with anxiety and there's a lot of Jonah inside of me. I'd like nothing more than to get on the next ship and head to Tarshish. I don't even know where that is. I just know it's a long way from here. I pray that you hear that in the spirit in which it is intended. But underneath all of that anxiety, I also feel a great deal of compassion. Compassion, which, to break it down into its root, means to suffer with. I feel very much filled with suffering. Not mine, but everyone's. I am suffering alongside of and with us all as a country as we try to figure out in the world what do we do now. That is what I come to this pulpit with this morning. But like Jonah, I'd like to avoid being swallowed by a whale. And so I probably have some responsibility to say something, yes? And so I wanted to speak to a church, a congregation, that is increasingly forced. Maybe that's not the right word. Maybe the right word is called. I'm not sure yet. We might be called. We might be forced. I don't know. We are constantly in the position of having to answer for national and global realities, yes? Now, congregations across the nation were founded on the notion of a global gospel. Yes, we believe that Jesus' story impacts everyone, but that that gospel never, it was global, yes, but it was also very, very local, and so we simply tried to live out the gospel message of Jesus Christ in a local reality. And for generations, it was thought, well, the local church wouldn't really have to answer all the time for everything that's happened, but to simply answer the challenges of the people who call this place home. With a couple of exceptions, it's always kind of been easy 
to ignore big issues with when the other is geographically, historically, ideologically separated from us. So for instance, we never had to really deal so much with our neighbor. It was easy to talk about communism because it was all the way over there. This was always, friends, a privilege. That there are other religious bodies who are our neighbors, brothers, and sisters who have lived regularly with their rights, their status, etc., always on the ballot all the time. But to my mind, we've never really had the pressure of having to ask the kinds of questions that now repeatedly show up on our plate. And now they arrive with breakneck, anxiety-inducing speed. I don't know if they cause anxiety for you. I'm telling you, they do in my soul. Every big issue lands at our feet. And what's worse, we're so used to clear moral and ethical lines that any time moral complexity is introduced, we've come to believe that that complexity means some kind of waffling. It means that now we're questioning our faith in some way. Except, friends, that this moral complexity was always at the heart of our faith. Because when the issues come close to us, when we are faced with big questions like we're asking as a nation now, we discover that we've, we were never really talking about ideas, we were always talking about people. People who will never succumb to such clear ethical and ideological lines. People who will always complicate our Sunday school narratives. People who can respond to us and can argue with us when big ideas like communism or slavery will not argue with us. People with whom we share power and whom we are called to prioritize and also with whom we share voting privileges. It's not that we've lost any kind of ethical clarity. It's that we've lost the capacity for understanding, for compassion with somebody who sees the world differently than we do. And so suddenly we as the church are called to do incredibly hard work lifelong formational work with the world screaming in our ears. So what are we supposed to do? We who are exhausted. We who are beaten down. We, some of you right now who are looking at me going, do we have to talk about this because everyone is? I understand that feeling, I do. We who are exiled from family and neighbors because of these conversations. And some of us who are just flat out scared. Some of us who are short on capacity for sorrow, grief, anger, pain. we got to do this all over again. Well, we as a church, and this is all that I have to offer this morning, is we do what we have always done. And I do intend to put a smile on your face. We turn to the little old church ladies. That's what we've always done, right? Where do we go? Well, we ask, let's ask the church ladies. And today I'd like to offer one little church lady, a simple saint, who like us, exhausted, beaten down, exiled, and flat out scared, but who had had enough, and she was scared enough to do something. And I take a great amount of courage from a woman who was never named in the scriptures. And it is, of course, our story from Luke chapter 8. Let us imagine this woman for a moment. This woman has so much going against her. First of all, she is a woman, and she is a woman who is alone, which is the worst place to be in that culture. Oh, by the way, it might be one of the worst places to be in this culture. She's been religiously unclean for 12 years. This hemorrhaging is not just a medical concern. We've got to, we're used to thinking of this as the issues that show up on a prayer list. It's not that she just had an issue that need prayed over. It's an issue that separated her to the point where she would be shunned from a gathering such as this. She can't get on the prayer list because she's unclean. And because of that, she's exiled from family, friends, community. But she wonders as this man walks through town. Now, we don't know if she knew who Jesus was. Maybe she was just a party crasher. Like, that guy in the middle seems to be the important guy. I'm going to go see how close I can get to him. I mean, how many of us maybe have done that once or twice? Yeah, I see that guy in the airport. I'm going to go see if that's who it is. That's what she does. So she wonders, and that wondering seems to be this beautiful intersection of her soul, this gentle, wizened humility alongside a solid helping of who even cares anymore. What's the worst that's going to happen to me? I'm going to go track this guy down. And she comes up behind him ever so subtly, this beautifully intimate, tiny gesture, and just touches the fringe of his cloak. And she's made well. I want you to hear that again. She is made well. 
Think if that was you for a second. What would it mean for you to be made well? Use your imagination. Let your imagination spiral out of control. I suspect the first thing you would do is you would feel some of the pains in your body, yes? Got one in my knee, got two in my wrist. I blame hockey for that. The first thing that goes is like, wow, my body would feel better. But is that it? Your spirit, your soul, your relationships made well? Use your imagination. What would it mean for you to be made well? Not just your body, but everything, all of it. And this is the world that suddenly comes crashing down upon this woman when she is made well. Now this woman's courage, and this beautiful thing is one thing, but I want to invite you for a second to set the woman aside. We will come back to her, but let's talk about Jesus' role in this moment. This is one of the more interesting moments in Jesus' life, for my money. Because at every turn... We see Jesus invested in relationship, right? We see just walking up to somebody and all the healing, all the issues, are all, almost all of them are face-to-face. Jesus builds this relationship and it is out of that that healing comes. But in this one, it says power just flows out of him. And I have so many questions about that. I have so many questions about what that means. What would that feel like for Jesus? What did that feel like for the woman? How do you know that power is flowing? Like, don't we wonder at that? I'm like, what in the world's going on here? There's this automatic kind of thing that comes when she touches the robe of Jesus' garment. It's weird, right? We're used to Jesus with power, but it's always active. It is always a choice by Jesus. It's almost like Jesus isn't involved in this thing, and yet the process works. But this tells us something about Jesus, yes? Of course Jesus is about relationship. Jesus yearns to look at us face to face and to tell us, your faith has made you well. But if we're looking for some simple clarity on a day where clarity is hard to come by, here's a simple truth for us. One cannot help but be changed the minute you get close to Jesus. Hear that again. One cannot help but be changed the minute that you draw close to Jesus. When we reach out, we are seeking just the edge of the garment of Jesus. Even if there's some perceived sense that Jesus doesn't even know we exist. Jesus isn't even aware of what we're up to. When those doubts and those things are swirling around us and we're like, Jesus, are you even aware of my existence? There is, this story tells us that when we reach out, every time we approach Jesus, we find healing. That is a hard lesson of faith, but I believe it, and I think its message is important today. We cannot help but get close to Jesus. Whether we know it or not, healing happens. And think about all the ways that that plays out. Every time we crack open a Bible, every time we approach the communion table, every time we remember our baptism, every time we give alms, every time we show compassion for another, every time we wander in this place, not quite sure why we got up in the first place, every time we look at our neighbor and say, good morning, I don't know what you're doing here either, but I'm glad you're here. Every time we draw near to Jesus, power flows from him. Jesus cannot help it. Jesus' compassion runs so deep, he cannot help but power go out from him and it be healing. And it is not dependent on our ability to perceive it. Thanks be to God. But we also have to say the other thing. That yes, power flows out of Jesus, but Jesus is not and should never be confused with this idea of like a spiritual vending machine. The things we do are not just put in your quarter and out comes grace. Jesus' goodness and his mercy and his grace are both inevitable and personal. It doesn't depend on us. God's grace does not depend on us, but it will never ignore us. So the minute that we come to know that healing, Jesus wants to know who it was, and Jesus wants to talk to us. Jesus turns, sensing that something has happened. Again, this notion, like, What does it mean the power goes out from you? But anyway, and that actually becomes the moment of tension, right? That actually becomes the the, the fulcrum of this story because she thought, I'm getting away. 
He doesn't need to deal with me. He doesn't want to deal with me. He doesn't care about me, so I'm just going to grab and go. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's not how this is going to work because there is no such thing as healing without relationship. Jesus is going to heal, and then he says, come unto me. And Jesus goes seeking this woman. Just like the father and the prodigal son, Jesus is scanning the crowd, scanning the horizon, trying to figure out who in the world wanted to be so close to him, wanted to seek that healing. He's looking for his child. The apostles are like, Jesus, are you serious right now? There's like a thousand people here. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. We're going to find this person. And when she realizes she can't get away, we imagine her somewhat elderly. And so running away and hiding probably wasn't what she wanted to be doing on that particular day. All, she realized all she can do is fall down trembling. And she tells her story, excuse me, she tells her story. And Jesus, far from saying, you know, next time I really need you to bring a permission slip, next time I really need you to ask permission, no, he doesn't do that. Jesus invites her back into relationship. He calls her daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Isn't that what we want? And isn't that what we lack in our world today? We want relationship. We're desperate for healing. God, we want nothing more than peace. And I believe in this story today, Jesus shows us a way. It is through the goodness of Jesus that is pouring out every time we ask. And it is relationship which is restoring us to God and to one another. But friends, the reason we struggle with this and the reason these kind of conversations are hard in the church, and if they're hard in the church, God knows they're hard in our nation, is because we keep looking for healing in all the wrong ways. We continue to ask powers and principalities to be impersonal dispensers of our convictions without ever considering what those decisions do to real people. Are we really that convinced that being right will set the world aright? Let me ask that again. Are we really convinced that being right will set the world aright? And all y'all who have a sibling know that being right lasts for about a minute at best. You've been there. I've been there. And so to the church I asked this morning, are we seeking healing or do we just want victory? One changes the world and one drives us farther into chaos. The church is called to be brought back into relationship with God and with one another, which requires attention that sustains life. It's not, about, it's not about eliminating one side of some of these things. It's about saying that it's inside of this tension, these questions, this difficulty, where the solutions, where healing happens. It's not about being right, it's about getting it right, ensuring that our neighbors can know that love, healing, and restoration that this woman had the courage to go searching for. That's what the church is called to in this moment. That until we cultivate a curious heart for those who see it differently than us, until we cultivate a listening spirit that is willing to resist that impulse to speak back, until we cultivate compassion to be willing to suffer with the other person before we speak, until we cultivate what Paul listed is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, something else, and self-control. Almost had them all. Sunday school teachers will get after me later. Until we cultivate that, we're poorly positioned to offer anything of value to a world spinning faster and more chaotically. But as always, it's the little church lady that offers hope. Jesus will be good to us, and he will restore us one to another. So friends, the days ahead are not going to be easier. Every time we think we've come to the, all right, this is the issue, wait a week. And I laugh so I don't cry about that. And friends, let me tell you that we, here at St. Mary's, will not solve the issues. And it seems unlikely that we will win any of our neighbors with mere words. Yes, we are called to witness to bigger issues. But we will not solve them here. They're too big for us. 
And we are too fuzzy-headed in our world to respond with any kind of clarity. We're unpracticed in the art of compassion. What Jesus would say, love your enemies as yourself. We are unpracticed in this. Not because we failed, but because it's the culture in which we live and breathe and move. And let's be honest, some of us are just too scared to move at all. That's me. And maybe all of that will loosen up in time. But if we are to do anything, the church needs to be brazenly, naively, hopefully willing to reach out to touch the cloak of Jesus in these times. Not to fix another person, but to see to it that we are healed. To allow ourselves to be brought back into relationship with God. To allow ourselves to be brought back into relationship with one another. To, re- to reestablish this tension between differing views that enables us to find a way forward. And then to offer some healing and compassion across lines, across divisions. But always, always informed by a faith that says that God is going to be eternally good to us who invites us to draw near to him. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. We have it in our promises. And so friends, that's where I'm left today. How are we going to do this? I don't know where we're going to land. Shoot, I'm still figuring out where in the world we are. It can feel like a whole bunch of landmines when you're walking around not sure who's where and what they think and how they'll respond. That's a difficult place to be. But we can commit to being the church of Jesus Christ in some capacity. Uncomfortable at times, yes. Difficult at times, yes. But we can commit to being that kind of church that reaches out and holds on to Jesus before anything else. And in that, we can be an example that the world so desperately needs. May God take what we have and like loaves and fishes, multiply it into good for others. Amen. And so, you know what's funny on occasion? I'm going to tell you right now, Mary Ann submitted a list back when I started here of like, here's hymns we like to do. And every once in a while I go back to it, I'm like, what haven't we done in a while? And so I'm like on vacation brain. I'm like, I don't want to think about this. Just eh, Ain't nobody showing up anyway. Let's just do a bunch of hymns we haven't done. And this is the one that landed on this particular spot before I heard anything was going down this week. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I invite you to stand hymn 579 and may the Lord do with this hymn what he will with you.
Thank you very much. Please be seated. And I love that hymn, not because all those things don't need to be prayed for. Goodness gracious, not the preacher. Seriously? No, somebody better be praying for the preacher. But no, that hymn, what it does is that it keeps us from praying with our elbows. I heard somebody say this one time. They're like, you've done this where you're like, hey, you should listen to that. Hey, that should really apply to you. Hey, that sounds like something that should be for that guy over there. And it eliminates praying with our elbows. Not that guy, not that guy, not my neighbor, not my mother, not my father, not my brother, not my sister, me. Me. Because sometimes we want the target. We want God's grace to be about anybody but me. We want God's change to be about anybody but me. Leave it to the wisdom and the African-American spirituals to be that, yeah, not so much. It is me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And because it's me, because it's you, because it's us, we confess our faith together no matter how strongly or how loosely or how frailly we hold it, but nevertheless we confess our faith in Father, Son, Holy Spirit as together we confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we do the work that we just sang about. It's time for us to go before our Lord in prayer. And had a, a lot of things land on my prayer list today. So if you're like, gee, there's none of this in the bulletin, I know it's been a, it's been a busy morning. Some of it wonderful and celebratory, others which are heartfelt and sorrowful. So we'll begin with the celebratory, and I'll invite you all to be in prayer um, for what happened here yesterday, right on this altar, as we, uh, as we welcome to the world Connor and Heather Adamson. Um, for those of you who don't know, Heather McKay is Alan Harmon's granddaughter, and we were, uh, we were uh, blessed to be able to celebrate her marriage. And so I invite you to pray for Connor and Heather in the days ahead, um, also for Alan and for his family as they celebrate and recover from a wonderful celebration yesterday. To that end, I was also asked specifically to wish to offer well wishes to my dear friends Dom and Steph, who are celebrating their 12th anniversary today. Yes, it's your mother, Um, but nevertheless. (laughs) And so, uh, so, and I cannot help but remember that day, and there are stories to be told about that day, which I'm sure we'll do today, Um, but to be able to remember that day and then to watch Taylor light the candles today, it was just, there was a little bit of a, that's special to me, and so we offer that, our celebration to you as well. But we were asked to pray for needs in our community as well. And I uh, want to invite you all to be in prayer for the families of, um, of two young men, Wesley Singh and Kyler Robinson, Wesley 19 and Kyler 20, both who were killed as a result of a car accident last Sunday um, and who are dear, dear friends of Haley Nicklo and Trenton Fitz. And so it comes very, very close to the larger um, Mayo family. And so um, just a horrible, horrible situation, the death of these two young men and also how that place for Haley and for her friends as they are brought face to face with untimely loss. And so please be in prayer for Wesley and for Kyler and for their families. And then also um, one that I'm going to add to the prayer list. I'm not quite sure that I have permission for it. So simply allow me to say that I have a dear friend um, whose newborn child um, ended up at Hershey Medical Center for a variety of reasons. Um, And you can only imagine the fear um, that that, um, my dear friend and his wife are feeling at the moment. So the baby is doing well, um, but there is a ways to go. And so please be in prayer for my friend. Um, And please, I don't mean to withhold names. I just always like to make sure I have permission before I start running my mouth in a public setting. And so, friends, let us go before our Lord in prayer. It's me, O Lord, and it's us, O Lord, standing in need of prayer. Lord, yet another day, another week where we feel like we are forced into this scorched earth reality of winners and losers, of politics and positions not of coming together, but of being further driven apart. And Lord, we feel that burden and that tension here today. Lord, whether it weighs heavy on our mind or not, it affects us all. So into this place we come, 
just saying, Lord, it's me. And it's me that needs healing. It's me that needs restoration to relationship. It's me that needs clarity as to what in the world we're called to do at this particular time. And yet we remember and would borrow the words that one man spoke to Esther, our sister in faith, who said, for such a time as this. Lord, we are your church. We are the ones called to this moment. So, Lord, we are the ones called to compassion to listening, to understanding, to, yes, the moral complexity of the issues that our times demand us to face. So we pray that you would give us the courage and strength to do just that. Lord, give us faith that when we draw close to you, you draw close to us in power. And every time we do so, there is a sense of healing, whether we perceive it or not, because it depends not on us. Lord, help us to invite others when anxiety, confusion, anger, settles in their soul to simply invite them to come and to be in the presence of Jesus who hears us out and who loves us as we are. Lord, may we bear witness to what it looks like to live the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest. Lord, we know those things are in short supply in our world, but maybe they can be found here in these little communities that just go ahead and care for one another, come what may. So Lord, help us learn how to do that all the better. We commit ourselves to you, commit our nation and our world to you. We also commit our neighbors to you. And so Lord, today we give thanks for the new creation that you have made, Connor and Heather Adamson. We thank you for Heather and for her family and for their service and love in this church. And we honor their marriage We celebrate uh, the days that are ahead for them. Would you bless them in these first days of marriage? Lord, may they know the joy of that, and may they grow in peace and love towards you and towards one another. But Lord, our hearts are also weighed down as we hear the story of Wesley Singh and Kyler Robinson, Lord, and our heart breaks at the untimely loss of life. And Lord, we pray for them and we pray for their families as they process this unimaginable loss. We think especially of Haley and Trenton as they struggle with this loss. And Lord, we ask, Lord, not that they would not feel that pain, but rather that that pain would would bring about comfort and courage with one another, that you would support them and love them in their time of need. And Lord, finally, we pray for this friend, his wife and their newborn baby, Lord, as they, uh, they seek healing for their child. And we thank you for the progress that the child has made continue to lift them all to you and ask for your blessings upon them. Lord, these are the prayer requests that we offer this day with our words as a, as a community. Here are also the prayers we lift up individually in the quiet of our own hearts. All these things we ask, O oh God, because we believe that drawing close and touching the cloak matters. And so with humility and courage ab- ab- abounding, we offer this up to you and trust in your grace and mercy. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And friends, as always, when we know not what to pray, When words escape us, when emotions confuse us, Jesus says, look, it's all right. Come to me and pray like this. And so in obedience, we do precisely that as we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. That's the way. (laughs) And so friends, in a world that feels chaotic, I'm always reminded, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, yes, I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd, but he always asks in in 
If you hear him talk about the novel that he wrote, Lord of the Rings, he said, yes, we're accustomed to tragedy in our world. He says, we're accustomed to things going sideways. We're used to hearing those stories. But then he coined this word that has been strengthening me and holding me up. He said, there's also the notion of you catastrophe, not like you catastrophe, like catastrophe in your life, but the idea that good comes exploding out just as much as evil does and how little shrift we give that, that there are miracles that break forth all the time. And that's why we continue to make investments in places like this and in one another in the work that we do because goodness continues to pour out as much as the tension and the struggle does. And so we bring these offerings forward. We say, thank you for giving them. We offer them to God and say, God, do something awesome with it. That's our prayer for today. And so I invite you to join us in our prayer as we stand and sing. Friends, let us pray. Loving God, we praise you for your body, the church, who through the ages has proclaimed the love of Christ. Through their faithfulness, we have come to know Christ and experienced his love. Give us the same heart that through these gifts in our lives, a new generation of people might praise you with one heart and one voice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we'll conclude this morning singing hymn number 588 in the Blue Chalice Hymnal, singing Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And now, my friends, may God, who began a good work in you, continue to be at work in your life, guiding, teaching, and equipping you until Jesus Christ returns. May your love and compassion continue to grow, a love that is full of knowledge and wise insight, so that you will be able to recognize what matters and to live a life that is pure. May you live a life centered in the Holy Spirit, a life that bears rich fruit, all the good things that come from following the Spirit, for living this way will bring much glory and praise to God and much healing to our world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Thank you very much. Please be seated for just a couple of announcements. I'm going to do a couple of announcements. I'm going to invite our VBS folks to come forward quick. I'm going to do a couple, and then I'll turn it over to you, and then I'll wrap it up. But friends, thank you on a challenging Sunday to be here, to be with one another, and to consider um, what God is calling us to in this moment. And let me assure you all, there's way more to be said than has been said here today. But perhaps this is a place that we can start. And if not, then perhaps we'll find the place to start. But thank you again for joining in today. A couple of announcements before we have a very special announcement. We simply want to honor the gifts that have been given today. And for uh, first and foremost, the altar flowers are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Norma Boone by Debbie and Jeff Miller. We say thank you so much. And her birthday would have been celebrated on June, on June 21st. And so we say thank you and we say it's our joy to honor her today. Speaking of honoring, and spe while we're doing a whole bunch of wedding stuff going around, our tech sponsorship today is in celebration of Emily and Rob Brown's 25th anniversary, which I believe is on Tuesday, yes? Do I have that date correct? And so, um, so to the two of you, we offer our congratulations. We love you. We thank you so much for all that you do for us. Friends, I think it's appropriate we just say congratulations for making it 25 years. And so with that, I'm going to invite Emily forward. She's got an announcement about Vacation Bible School. Good morning. We are so excited that this year Vacation Bible School will be back in person. Um, we are doing it in the evening, which is a change from recent years. So we are running it um, July 17th through the 22nd from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, it is Norby, Non-Organic Robot Buddy Explorer class. We are uh, going to blast off from this church into uh, outer space because God's glory is out of this world. You knew the joke had to be in there somewhere, right? <laughs> so we are very excited to do this. Um, so a couple things that I want to bring to your attention. The first is on Sunday the 17th, we are doing our ice cream social. Um, the whole congregation is invited, so it is just a time to kick this off. So we hope we see everybody there, whether you have someone involved in VBS or not. Um, so please join us for that. Um, Next, the registration will be taken there in person, but also it will be available very shortly online. So if you have a child who's about age three through just completed fifth grade, we ask for you to register so we can have our numbers and make sure we have all the supplies we need ahead of time. Um, we are looking for some help. We are looking for adults and youth. So if you have middle school or high school students who would like to help out, we could use them. But we definitely also need adult volunteers. Some of the ways you can help. We need decorators. Decorators would be prior to July 17th. So we're looking for people who uh, have that creative bent or uh, just like to help uh, decorate our area um, we also need some help with areas like crafts and games and story time. Um, so if you are interested in helping with that, uh, we could use your help during the week of July 17th through 22nd. If you can't do every day, we can probably make use of you if you can do two, three, four nights. So please um, let us know. Uh, some other things that we could use. We need empty Kleenex boxes about that size, we need a few of these. So please, if you're emptying these with allergies, hold on to them, bring them into church, into the vestry. We also need packing pillows, I guess that's what we would call them. We need a bunch of these. Uh, so if you get these in the mail, please drop them off also in the vestry. I'm gonna have this box over there right now, but we'll probably have a larger one. For decorating, we want to make some robots, which means we need tubes, 
paper towel rolls. We need like old CDs, lids of, from juice containers, anything that we can kind of make robots out of, boxes. Um, so please drop those off so our creative decorators can make use of them and make some cool robots to decorate our area. Um, and then if you uh, would like to help and are unable to do any of those and you'd like to make a donation, um, please feel free to do so and just mark online the other box and say VBS or on your check mark that it's for VBS. We'll be buying supplies, decorations, food. So we'd appreciate any way that you can give you know, time, talents, or treasure. Um, we're appreciative of everyone's support. Um, if you have any questions or you're able to help in any of those ways, you can see me, you can see Wanda, or you can see Stacy. So we'd appreciate it. Thanks so much. So those packing pillows, you still need them blown up? Blown up, yes. Okay, because that's going to be real hard. Yes. All right, I get them and I stomp them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so. All right, and then final announcement for today. Um, just wanted to let you all know that uh, the next two weeks I will not be here. Jenny and I and the kids taking some time off, and so just wanted to make uh, a heads up about that. Next Sunday, we're very pleased to have the Reverend Ellen Whitco, who until recently was the pastor of Church of the Holy Trinity. Um, she will be here, and then on July the 10th, uh, it will be the Reverend Jerry Foos. Um, Jerry is a mentor of mine back when I was a member in discernment, and so Jerry and I have been walking together for quite some time, and I'm very grateful to invite him back to this pulpit. And so I invite you to be here, hang out with them. That's going to be great. And then, uh, and, but just so you know, I will be in the office, so to speak, this week. So if there's conversations or work that needs to happen, I will be here Monday through Thursday. Um, so everything for me starts on Friday. After Friday, um, as I often say to my kids, sometimes like, call me if you need me, but don't need me. Um, and, uh, and I will see you when I, when I come back. And so, uh, so I, I look forward to that. So friends, that's what we have for today. Thank you so much again for being here. May God bless you into the work that he has called you to do into the week. Until that, and until we are able to be together again, peace and good.